It's the display port. Uh, so there's a service announcement. So before the coffee break, there will be the um, conference picture. The so uh, the snapshot will be ah here inside. Okay, easy. Do you have the adapter? Okay, okay. He said he was getting it, so no. it was down here earlier. Sorry, it somehow <laughs> vanished. Excellent. Okay, so uh, it sounds like the microphone's working. Thanks for uh, inviting me, and thank you for hanging out and listening. As everyone said, it's really beautiful to be here, and it's a good excuse to, I feel like a motivational speaker, so I, that, that's pretty cool, and I get an excuse to eat meat every day, you know, so thanks, uh, thanks for having us. Anyway, that's the point. Um, the last talk ended with other stuff going on in the group and didn't have time to do it, so actually, before I turn to the topic at hand today, I just wanted to mention if, you know, some of the things going on in my research group, so if you're interested in these things, you can come ask me about it afterwards. So we do many, many things in the, in the area of ultra-cold matter, and today I'm going to tell you about things we do with molecules, but we also do other AMO systems, things like uh, fermions and optical lattices, or um, we've recently been looking even at photo association of alkaline earth atoms, um, new ways to cool systems. So uh, some interesting things there, things I think are interesting there. Uh, we've also been working on developing new types of numerical algorithms, and in particular algorithms where you can give rigorous error bounds about what happens in the thermodynamic limit, not just a statistical error bound, not just a uh, extrapolation of finite size, but where you can say, I guarantee you if you do this calculation, you can uh, put, you know, my answer is going to be in this range can even apply it to experiment. If you do a finite size experiment, we can guarantee what will happen in the thermodynamic limit for certain types of experiments. Um, and the, the final thing we do is we've been working on doing some new exactly solvable models using integrability. I have a student who's convinced he's going to solve some three-dimensional models, which has never been done in a non-trivial way before. So we'll see. I'm not sure I believe him, but we're spending some time working on it. Okay, but all of that's what I'm not going to tell you about today. What I'm going to tell you about today is um, uh, a subject that we've, uh, that's been touched on at this workshop, which is synthetic dimensions. But unlike the other talks, uh, the synthetic dimensions here are going to be realized in a different way by using, uh, by using molecules. And so as far as I know, we're the only people at the moment talking about doing this with molecules, but I think it's a really great idea. And so, uh, I would, of course, but, uh, so, but I hope to convince you it's also a really great idea. So let me start by acknowledging uh, the main collaborators. So the person who's really led this work been my postdoc, Bhuvanesh Sundar, and uh, uh, collaborator Bryce Gadway at UIUC has been thinking about building up some experiments. He's building a molecule experiment, and he would like to try some of these things. Um, but also, several other people in my group have been pretty important for this, so I just wanted to thank them. And you can find the basic idea in this paper that was submitted and published this year. So um, I like to give my conclusions of the talk right on the first slide. So feel free to just interrupt me. Uh, if we only get a quarter of the way through the talk, that'll be fine because all of the important messages are right here. So the main thing that we're going to learn is that molecules have extra degrees of freedom. We all know their dipole interaction, but they, the maybe less well-known thing is that they have lots of internal states that can be usefully used for science. And here we're especially going to think about rotational states. If you have a lot of rotational states, then uh, we can use those rotational states as an extra dimension of space. Should that clock be ticking, or do I just get an infinite amount of time? It's, you'll, you'll let me know? Or so, okay, good, good. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, so the extra rotational states are going to look like an extra dimension of space. So uh, this means you can engineer interesting things. It also means maybe you can make a four-dimensional system in the lab. The uh, synthetic lattice geometry and the band structure are fully tunable. 
you can control every tunneling, every on-site piece of the Hamiltonian in a, with essentially no extra difficulties in realizing these in the first place. And it's going to turn out that the interactions have a very special structure that will become clear by the end of the talk. I uh, might refer to them as sort of interdimensional, in-between dimensional is maybe a better way of thinking about it, that's going to lead to things like quantum strings, and I'll explain what that means, or membranes, and some topology. And we'll, if time allows, see all of these things. So I just want to say what I mean by a string, because it's not a particularly exotic thing, despite what you know mental associations you might have with this, but I think it is really something that is a genuinely new type of matter that we could explore. Um, so if this is, forget about what these white sites are, other than they're just some two-dimensional space that particles can live in, what I'm calling a string is when these particles spontaneously choose to live in a one-dimensional subset of that two-dimensional system. So I have this big two-dimensional space, and just like my shoestring does, we have our particles choosing to live in a chain in that two-dimensional space. That's what I mean by a quantum string. And so um, I'll let you mull this over as I go through the talk, but I don't actually know any other s phases and say um, cold matter or even really quantum matter where the fundamental constituents are extended objects. So we used to have particles, and I can think about it as a system of interacting particles. Maybe these particles can condense, and we've seen self-bound droplets, but that's still sort of a three-dimensional system. This is sort of like a self-bound droplet, but that's lost a dimension. So it self-binds down to 1D or 2D. OK. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think there are very close connections to that. Also, people have actually talked about chains and dipolar molecules before. I think Eugene Dimler, Anatoly Kuklov, I should have a citation to them. I don't, but no, none of them are here to hold me to it, I think. so. Um, the, uh, uh, but this is, I think, from an experimental perspective, much, much easier. That many of the difficulties with those systems are not inherited by this system. And so I'm not going to emphasize this too much, but, um, but a big goal in this has been to make sure that these occur in an experimentally achievable regime. It gets around some of the limitations that other systems have with reaching cold, uh, cold enough temperatures or with manipulating or detecting these. And I'm happy to discuss more, but maybe that'll be easier at the end than at the start. <laughs> so, okay, that's a string. The, uh, you know, and it's giving us a platform. These synthetic dimensions and ultra-cold molecules are going to give us a platform to do all kinds of things that everyone here is interested in, to do topology. And so because we have a fully tunable s extra dimension of space, we can imprint whatever band structure we want. We can have topological band structures at will. It's just as easy to make a gauge field as it is to not make a gauge field. Uh, you can imprint disorder at will. It can be correlated disorder, uncorrelated disorder. So you can study... Um, localization, for example, and there's going to be all this new many body physics of strings that I've hinted at. So, um, there are two things I need to describe to talk about synthetic dimensions and ultra cold molecules. One is synthetic dimensions, the other is ultra cold molecules. So, let's start about thinking about molecules. Molecules are a relatively new addition to the sort of ultra cold family. We've had uh, ultra cold atoms for a couple decades now or more. Um, but molecules are uh, only in the last 10 years have been realized. In 2008, the first ultra-cold molecules in this nearly degenerate regime that I'm interested in were realized in uh, 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 Debbie Jin and Juni's lab at Jilla. I should say there are many other ultra-cold molecule groups, but they tend to be very dilute, so the interaction effects aren't, aren't as important, or they're really not as ultra-cold as I want them to be. Um, so, but now there are you know, five or six groups, there may be some missing on here, depending on when I last updated this slide, uh, that, uh, that now have these ultra-cold molecules to play with. And there are a few reasons to explore these. You have chemistry that you can study. That's actually not something we want for the most part in these experiments. That's something we're going to work hard to get rid of. Uh, we have the strong dipolar interactions, and we have these internal states that I mentioned, rotation and vibrational states. And here, we're really going to be concentrating on the rotational states. And what's nice about these as compared to electronic states or something is that they live forever. So a rotational state will live for, I, I, I don't know, the spontaneous emission lifetime is, uh, I don't have it in notes or anything, but it's, it's, it's many minutes or hours or something. You know, it lives forever. So um, the, um, the experiments have, that people have done where they've worked with these rotational states observe the rotational states to live over the entire time scale of the experiment. So you can have these molecules sitting in an optical lattice for 25 seconds and the rotational states never decay. 
Okay. So that's really all I was going to say about optical molecules for now. The other part I have to explain is what a synthetic dimension is. Okay. And so this is a real dimension, in particular in a lattice. So if I have a particle moving in one dimension, it moves in some periodic potential. And I can think about this, at least if I'm in the one band limit, as a particle can sit in each of these discrete spatial locations. I can sit at lattice site one or lattice site two or lattice site three. I've just rotated this 90 degrees. And so the mapping, the synthetic dimension, is nothing more than saying, well, molecules can rotate. They can have some angular momentum. So one molecule has many different angular momentum states. And therefore, there's, at least between the Hilbert spaces, a one-to-one -one mapping between where I sit in the lattice or where I sit in this rotational spectrum. And this is just a trivial observation. Uh, it's very similar to the synthetic dimensions people have done using hyperfine states and atoms, where you have maybe three different hyperfine states, and you can treat them as the three-site wide lattice. Okay, so, uh, and here's just a list of people who have done this. I want to point out a couple advantages already at the single particle level of doing this with molecules versus other states. Probably the biggest and most obvious one is that you can genuinely think about using dozens of rotational states, maybe hundreds. And this is very different than the atoms. The atoms really are confined to two, three, four states. You know, maybe with these spin nine half objects, it's, it's 10 states or something. But that's, that's as big as it gets. But here, you're limited. Well, you'll, we'll see what we're limited by. The other thing which is less obvious is that they're actually very, very noise resilient. You can, when you have different rotational states, you can choose the two rotational states to be in the same hyperfine state. And so they end up being magnetic field insensitive. And you don't have to worry about magnetic field gradients and noise that you would have to in these other realizations. So that's potentially a technical advantage. So it's very challenging to get ultra-cold molecules. But once you have ultra-cold molecules, I think that um, many of these things are quite nice. Okay, so. Let's actually look through this in a little bit more detail. We're going to get a, a just briefly into the weeds of some molecular physics that uh, isn't crucial, but it is nice to see exactly what I mean when I'm talking about all these rotational states. So if I have one molecule, this is actually what the rotational spectrum looks like. It doesn't look like the one-dimensional chain of states I drew before. It's a rigid rotor. And just like spherical harmonics, there's a 0, 0, and then there's the angular momentum 1 and the angular momentum 2, and it keeps going. And what we want to do is to turn on some sort of field. This could actually be a magnetic or an electric field that's going to break these degeneracies. And once I've broken these degeneracies, it's going to turn out that these levels um, sort of are independent. So if the levels are degenerate, maybe I have to worry about them coupling in some fashion. But as long as they are split by this field, this is a pretty large energy scale. It could be 10 kilohertz. It could be larger, 100 kilohertz easily. This scale is gigahertz splitting the 1, 0, and the 0, 0 state. So these are huge energy scales for an ultra-cold experiment. And what that effectively means is that if I start in the 1, 0 state, there is no way for me to move over to the 1, 1 state because it's too far off resonant in energy. Even if it's lower in energy, there's no incoherent process that's going to dissipate me down. And all the on-resonant processes are too low in energy. So I can basically consider any set of non-degenerate states as an independent manifold and just throw away the other states I don't want. So as one example, I could choose the 0, 0, the 1, 1, the 2, 2, the 3, 3. This would sort of make a one-dimensional line of states just like I drew on the previous slide. Or I could do a vertical line. But the point is I can cut out something like that. Okay. So we said the Hilbert spaces were the same. I showed you how to get a one-dimensional Hilbert space out of the molecules. But of course, in the real lattice, there's tunneling between the lattice sites. And so we need to get the same thing in our synthetic dimension. And how you can do that with the molecules is to use uh, microwaves. These are microwave frequencies. You send in a bunch of microwaves to your chamber, and that's going to cause a uh, Rabi coupling between the different states. And we're just going to call that Rabi coupling a tunneling because it fits my analogy. OK. Each of these states, this is not a harmonic oscillator. This is an anharmonic spectrum. So the frequency that couples 0 to 1 is different than the frequency couples 1 to 2 is different than 2 to 3. And this means that you can energetically, spectroscopically address each of these transitions independently. So if I want to imprint some set of tunnelings, I think I have this on the next slide, I can just do this by sending in multiple frequency of microwaves, and, uh, and I can control every one of those. And thanks to cell phone technology, I think, this is what the experimentalists tell me, there's now lots of well-developed ways to control 
microwaves over a large bandwidth. And um, so they tell me I can literally plug in this uh, direct, di direct digital synthesis device, which I go order online to my computer, and it will shoot out microwaves across 90 gigahertz bandwidth or 40 gigahertz bandwidth or something. I just type in the wave uh, form I want, and it'll let me control all of these. So there are actually some nasty technical issues in terms of dealing with microwaves in a um, vacuum chamber, but I think these are actually non-problems, and if anyone wants to um, push me on that, I'm happy to try to defend that statement. Okay, so we have a way of just imprinting whatever set of tunnelings we want. So we can engineer our lattice geometries. I showed you the 1D chain, but we could also make a ladder, right? So I sort of have two parallel 1D chains here that I can couple together. Or maybe I can do something with periodic boundary conditions and make a ring. Or maybe I want to make a ring, but now I want to put it on a gauge field. Because it's not just the amplitudes of these that can be controlled, but I can control the amplitude in the phase. Okay. So this is being a little pedantic, but I just want to make clear that it's totally flexible. We can do on-site disorder. We can do even sort of two-dimensional chunks of this. You, can, you have a lot of flexibility. Oh, and for free, just the same way you can control the tunnelings, you can also do single-site imaging. I can measure what is the population of a molecule being on this side or this side or this side or this side. It's like getting a quantum gas microscope for free in the synthetic space. Okay. All right. Yep. That's right. That's right. That's right. So actually, probably the best way to do the imaging right now is you pick what state you want to image, you coherently transfer to the M equals zero, the L equals zero, M equals zero state, and image that state. Um, there may be ways of doing direct imaging, but, uh, but so far that's been standard practice for just playing with the lowest few states. Um, we, we actually have some proposals, thinking about this with Bryce, about maybe we could use some Faraday rotation, which should be strong in these molecules, to do a non-destructive imaging and measure out different... Uh, L and M levels, but this needs to be fleshed out. Um, okay, so I've showed you already this all single particle physics, but at least at the level of topological band structures, localization, things like that, now we have all the tools to go m measure that in the lab. You can realize these things in the lab. What I'd love to see someone do is there's this periodic table of topological insulators, periodic uh, uh, topological band structures. You could just day one do this, went to periodic table day two, do this one, and just scan out the whole thing and show you can do them all. And probably if you're an experimentalist, that's a nice nature paper or something. But uh, as a theorist, it's single particle physics, so I want to quickly move on and start talking about many body physics. Um, so in particular, I've been hinting at strings, and I want to know, you, know, you want to know, I hope, uh, where these strings come from and what I'm talking about here. So we're going to have to go from one molecule all the way to two molecules, and then we'll build our way up from there. So two molecules, we have a dipole-dipole interaction. It looks like we all know from Jackson. All we have to do is take this dipole-dipole interaction and project it onto the subspace I've been talking about. And when you do that, I'm just going to draw in pictures for a second what the Hamiltonian looks like. There's one type of process, so I have two molecules in my real space lattice now. So this direction, the x direction, is real space. This vertical direction is our synthetic space. And the process that happens is this flip-flop process. So one molecule can go from n to n plus 1, the other molecule goes from n plus 1 to n. Okay. Turns out that's really the only process, interaction process, that's allowed. We want to work in a regime where we shut off all the other processes. So in principle, you might think things like this are possible. Certainly there are matrix elements for this process I'm drawing on the right, um, but they're forbidden energetically because of these huge energy separations of gigahertz. So we don't have to worry about these things that I'm drawing on the right. Also, you could work in a regime where the molecules can tunnel between lattice sites, but we've intentionally not worked in that regime because bad things like chemical reactions happen. Even if you don't have reactive molecules, bad things happen. I was going to spend a slide talking about that, but I think I'm just going to skip it. Let me just say that there's a lot of interesting things that can happen, even if you don't have reactive molecules. You have these, quote, non-reactive molecules, where when they get on one lattice site, I would say that we don't understand the physics at all. And, uh, and in a gas, I'd say there are fundamental questions like, can a ground state molecular BC even exist in principle? And I would say that's an open question, and I'd be happy to talk more about that as well. But let me just skip that because of time. So, um, so the interactions for two molecules, you do this projection. Um, this is just what I said before. If you want to see it written out in, its, in a sort of Hamiltonian, I put it here. I'll let you look at that while I answer the question. Yeah. That's right. 
that's, that's absolutely right. And that's a peculiarity that makes this sort of a mixed dimensional system. And, and uh, so that, that's a very, very good point. So the point is that I want one molecule uh, per lattice site, and that means there's always going to be one molecule in this whole extended dimension. And that's very different from a normal dimension, right? So the number of particles scales with, if I have a one real dimension, one synthetic dimension, the number of particles scales like L, the number, the area of space scales like L squared. So it's, it's, it's weird. Okay. Um, okay, so you've seen enough of the Hamiltonian. Uh, oh, I should also say that I'm also thinking about exactly one per site, so I'm not including holes in the explicit calculations, but I think a lot of the interesting physics will persist even if you dilute this lattice and have a bunch of holes in it. Okay, so I wanted to point out that this isn't, you know, this is a, so far it's all been theory, but this isn't totally far-fetched. So experiments have already been done for a synthetic dimension of two sites. Okay, and that was published here in these papers, uh, in th these first two papers. They didn't use this language. When you only have two sites, it looks a lot like a spin one-half, and this is a much more natural language to use there. Um, but the, technically, it's exactly the same thing. And so all you have to do is add more microwaves, and you will be able to go from n equal 2 in your synthetic dimension to n equal 3 to n equal 4 and so on. Okay. And so uh, I don't think it's far off experimentally. All the tools are there. Okay, so what happens with many particles? We got one particle, we got two particles. Let's figure out what happens with many. And actually, we have to figure out what really happens with two particles first. I just told you the interaction, but what does it do? So there are two competing terms. There's the synthetic tunneling, which will delocalize particles in the synthetic direction. And then there's the interaction term. And what the interaction term wants to do is actually bind molecules. So to understand this, think about if the two molecules are far apart in the synthetic dimension, then nothing's going to happen because they can't resonate, right? That interaction term I said wasn't there. But if they're nearby, they can move back and forth. And if they're moving back and forth, we know that a resonance in quantum mechanics lowers your energy, right? And so it's like having an attractive potential in the synthetic dimension. So you're going to make dimers, okay? Um, so that's simple enough. Now what happens when we extend this to more than two particles? Okay. So here I have a dimer. Maybe when I go to the next site, it kind of wants to dimerize with this one, and the next site wants to dimerize with this one, and now you can see how a string builds up. And that's exactly what we find. Here's the cartoon in the bottom picture. We've confirmed this picture that, in fact, all of these molecules will sit within two or three sites, or some finite number of sites, um, by several mean field treatments, and they show that these exist in 1D and 2D, and also 3D with some caveats. I'm talking about the real space dimension. So that corresponds to strings, to two-dimensional membranes, and to three brains, or whatever you call these. Um, and we have now confirmed this with an exact solution at a special point in 1D. We've shown that these strings exist. And with numerical DMRG uh, calculations over a broad range of parameters. And so that's actually what's being plotted here, some results of the DMRG. Um, it's a little bit of a complicated plot. Maybe just look at this, what I'm labeling as the n equal infinity curve, this one that dips below. And at least very roughly, you can see there's a window here where what I'm plotting is the width of the string measured by basically the f how, over how many sites is there a population, how many synthetic sites is there a population. And there's a window here where it's very close to zero. And so what you've got is a transition from this window where it's zero to regions where it's finite. So in this region where the width is zero, it's normalized by the length of the synthetic dimension. That's your string. You have a finite width string in an infinite dimension. Okay. So, so it, and it's richer than that because not only do we have the strings, we also have this unbound gas, the undimerized parameter regime, as I tune the ratio of the tunneling to the interaction, and I can go between them. And so I think there's some really interesting physics as you go between them. Okay, but this is, this is in many ways the punchline about these strings. So um, this is a good place to pause and see if anyone has questions on this. Uh, and, and also for me to point out that there are many mysteries. So we have, we have a one-dimensional system in one limit. We have a two-dimensional system in one limit. There's some type of phase transition for how you go between these. And I simply don't know of, say, a field theory or some effective theory to capture this transition. We don't know what the um, sort of effective universal description of this phase transition is. We do, we are starting to get a good handle on what the excitations of these strings look like. And let me just hint at what ha ends up happening. Um, maybe I can use some chalk, actually. So we've got these strings, 
and they've sort of formed like this. But within each of these strings, a particle can sit in the sort of upper or the lower place. If it's a wider string, there are more choices. But this actually starts to look like a spin one half, or if you like hardcore bosons. I can have a particle or not have a particle on each site. And what's going to happen is I'm effectively going to get a BC within this manifold. So there are two pieces of physics. First, I form the string, and this string has string fluctuations and excitations like that. And then on top of this string, I have an emergent Bose-Einstein condensate that corresponds to whether I'm in the upper part of the string or the lower part of the string. So I have boson, a Bose-Einstein condensate living on a string. And if you actually do the exact calculation, it turns out there are two Bose-Einstein condensates that live on the string. And so I, I think there's a very interesting excitation spectrum here that's not obvious from just looking at it. So I don't know. So before I continue and talk about the topology stuff, it, does this make sense? Uh, did anyone have questions on the... Uh, yeah, okay. Because it's quasi-one-dimensional. So it's a quasi-condensate. It actually maps exactly... Oh, the exact solution breaks into sectors depending on where the string sits and some other conservation laws. But within each of those sectors, it actually maps exactly onto hardcore bosons in 1D. So you get a quasi-condensate. If you actually had a two-dimensional membrane, then you should presumably have a real superfluid and a real condensate. Yeah. Good. They're the ground state. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So... Um, because they're effectively very narrow, and l let's imagine that if instead of 1D, well, let's imagine that a mean field picture is enough to describe this. So you can imagine if it's spontaneously reduced down to the two sites, basically what it's going to look like is just a coherent superposition of these two states, product state, coherent superposition of these two states, product state, coherent superposition of those two states. That's what the mean field description would give at least. That's not the exact description for this system, but that's close to it. So what you can do is you, adi or you prepare that state, um, the product state, because that's very easy to do an experiment, and then you adiabatically deform some parameter to take you into this. We've done numerical simulations with this, and it looks possible, but we, I, you know, we need to look at timescales to really say whether just how feasible that's going to be. If not, the, I don't think you really have to get all that close to the ground state. I think what's going to happen is even if you can just get kind of close, then, um, then you're still going to see some fairly sharp change between going from a finite width object to an extended object. Um, so even if you're not in the ground state, what you'll presumably see is some finite width object that just kind of bounces around and fluctuates a little bit. But these are open questions and are, are absolutely things that are on our agenda. Um, it's a hard problem to understand because it does involve dynamics and things. So we've been working mainly in 1D to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a great question. So sorry, I, I didn't mention this. So ever, all the calculations I'm showing you here, if I have a w real one-dimensional system, we've been assuming that the dipole uh, or uh, quantization axis is perpendicular to that line. Or if you're in 2D, the dipole quantization axis is perpendicular to it. And I said 3D, there are some caveats about these three brains, and that's what we don't know. So if you had an isotropic dipole interaction, then you would have absolutely a three brain. In this case, I don't know. We haven't treated the anisotropy yet. That's, that's, that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. Louder. Super. Yeah, I was going to ask, I was going to encourage someone to ask this question. So um, the point is that because I only have one molecule per lattice site, this is just a spin model with a really big spin, right? I can think about this. On this site, I have 10 states I can be in, so it's like a spin 9.5 or whatever. On this site, I have spin 9.5. Okay, I actually want to argue that that's a very bad way to think about this system. Of course, it's in principle possible. You have the right Hilbert space, and I can write down some spin-spin interaction that gives me exactly this. But the reason it's not the right way to think about it is because the symmetries of this are actually very, very different from a typical spin symmetry. So when spin models are simple and natural looking, they only have a few terms. You know, they have, they have an XXZ form or something. That happens when there's some rotational symmetry. If you don't have that rotational symmetry and you have a big spin, if I have a spin S, I'm going to have S terms in my Hamiltonian, right? And so, um, and so the rotational 
symmetry is what makes the largest limit look fine in, in a normal spin. In contrast here, you actually have a translational symmetry. So the, you can tune the tunnelings to be equal, and that's the, sorry, that's the case I've been studying so far in the string part and the many body part. The tunnelings are all equal. Also, when you calculate the interaction matrix elements, they're all equal except for small n, so they asymptote to a constant. So you really do have this effectively translationally invariant interaction. And that's very different from a typical large spin. So you can, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. You can use either of these languages, but I think it's much more natural to use the translation invariance of the synthetic dimension for this reason. Okay, so one minute. Okay, good. So let me just spend one minute just giving you a taste of what's going on with the, uh, does this, oh, this includes questions though. Uh, okay, let me just give you a real quick 30 second taste of, Okay, okay, okay. So the, the, the um, oh, okay, okay. Here's how you get topological bands. Okay, so one, uh, one dimensional system, maybe the simplest uh, type of topology you can have is what's called the SSH model. We've heard about it at the workshop. You stagger the tunneling, so weak tunneling, strong tunneling, weak tunneling, strong tun tunneling. And here I'm plotting the eigenstates. You get a valence band, a conduction band, and you get these protected, topologically protected, symmetry, topologically protected edge states. Um, and, and so that's at the one particle level what you've got. Um, and our basic questions have been what happens when you turn on interactions between this. So because you can't fill this band, we can't have more than one particle per site, you can't do the normal thing and make a topological insulator. You can't just fill the band and have your uh, chemical potential sitting somewhere here. Instead, if you want to see this interesting physics, you so, well, somehow have to populate the edge states by hand and then maybe look at what happens to the dynamics in that model. And I'm not going to tell you about it, but you get things, what I call a topologically protected Ising model, and we've been thinking about more complicated scenarios where you have a bunch of uh, coupled integer quantum Hall puddles, and uh, so I think there are interesting things to do there. Okay, so these are my conclusions, and I'll wrap up here. Thanks. Okay, thanks Can I for this nice, really nice talk. I think we have time for uh, one or two questions, if, if any. Ludic. <laughs>